All right, everybody, good afternoon and welcome to this um, uh, one more web learning webinar on behalf of the Learning and OD Roundtable. I'm Dr. Sujaya Banerjee and I am the founder of the Learning and OD Roundtable. Um, I'm going to start by doing a quick check. We did do a sound check before you all came in on board, but a quick check to be able to reconfirm to me through your chats that you are able to hear, hear me right now. Is the audio working good? Even if a few of you respond, it'll be great. Is the audio working good for you? Are you able to hear me clearly? Are you able to see the screen clearly? Just give us a, a quick yes from a couple of you and we'll get started. Sunit, are we doing good? Can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yes, we are. All right, super. All right, everyone. So at this stage, I'm going to take you through the a few slides on the Learning and ODA Roundtable and a few things for those of you who don't yet know about the Learning and ODA Roundtable. Sunit, will you help me with the slides, please? Okay, the Learning and ODA Roundtable, we started this about 10 years ago. This is a forum of HR learning OD professionals, talent professionals. And we started this about a decade ago. It's a not-for-profit charity. And it was started to be able to help the community uh, build capabilities in the space of personal transformation and organizational transformation. And the idea was to be able to build capabilities to be able to drive change so that more and more members can actually convert their organizations into learning organizations. So that being the credo or the vision of the Learning and OD Roundtable, we started about a decade ago, 13 organizations coming together to be able to create this. We now have, can you move forward, about 22,000 plus members in this growing community uh, as we spread from Mumbai into Delhi, Pune, Hyderabad, um, and Bangalore. Um, so Delhi, Hyderabad, Delhi, and Bangalore. Can we move forward, please? Um, so what do we do at the Learning and OD Roundtable? Uh, we have a whole host of uh, masterclasses uh, that, we, that we actually conduct across cities. These are normally half-day learning sessions. The idea is to be able to expose members to uh, contemporary thought leadership, to expose uh, members to uh, the latest tools, techniques, hacks in the space of learning, uh, to be able to enable uh, members to, to be able to take back new contemporary thinking to their organizations to be able to drive change. We did do this through discussions, debates, various interesting formats of learning. Um, we have the uh, seven speakers, 17 minute uh, format, which is like seven TED-like talks followed by discussions. And the idea being that we kind of create an encouraging and uh, meaningful dialogue between the community where we can share not just best practices, but also failure stories from which we can actually learn uh, meaningfully. Uh, increasingly, the Learning and OD Roundtable has expanded to be able to include people from outside the HR Learning OD community. We have a very significant number of people who are from the corporate communication space. We have a large number of people who are from the marketing space. Um, many uh, line managers and other business leaders who drive change within organizations who are also part of this, academicians, consultants, researchers, who all become part of this ever-growing community called the Learning and OD Roundtable. Can we move forward? Here are the people, the wing below our wings, so to speak, all the people who form the governing council of the Learning and OD Roundtable. We've got Dr. Akil Basrai. Many of you would know of him. He's a veteran HR professional, having worked with companies like Shell um, and, uh, and, and Unilever's. Uh, we have Adil Malia, who's worked with Coke, who's the president of human resources of the SR Group before um, he started the firm. Uh, Srinivas Venkatram uh, of Illumin Labs, uh, Rajesh Padmanabhan of Wellspun, um, uh, Dr. Sujaya Banerjee, which is myself. I'm the founder CEO of Capstone People Consulting. Uh, Manu Vadva of Sony Pictures. Uh, we've got uh, Prince Augustine of the Mahindra Group, Rajeshwar Upadhyay of the Academy of Applied Emotional Intelligence. And we have Rajesh Kamat of Chanakya Consulting. So these are the people who are behind uh, what you see as the Learning and OD Roundtable. Move forward. Uh, those are all our centers. So depending on where you're joining from, uh, take a look at that on the other side of the lockdown. We're looking forward to be able to see you in person. In the interim, all our chapters are being serviced through a series of virtual learning options. Um, a lot of them are unpaid webinars like the one you're attending right now, but we have some very stellar offerings through the LNOD Academy. We also started the Women Leadership Forum of Asia about five years ago. This does work in the space of diversity and inclusion for organizations and to help members um, understand the vast opportunities with diversity um, and diverse and inclusive cultures. 
um, the the Women Leadership Forum of Asia also has a plethora of virtual offerings, and I recommend strongly that you explore those. Um, join this movement by becoming a member of the Learning Nodi Roundtable, so that you can get access to a whole lot of learning products and services, a very significant number of them at huge discounts and very attractive prices, including a lot of online products and services, uh, mental health services, a whole lot of other things which are being provided to members and their organizations. A um, lot of it pro bono through the lockdown, if you remember. So please reach out to us if you'd like to be a member with an individual member or a corporate member. Uh, all these memberships are very well priced for the value that you really get. And the corporate memberships are rolling memberships, which means that when you pay up for 10, any 10 people can attend um, any of our programs through the year. Um, let's move forward. Uh, this is a very interesting service. We started this about three weeks ago, into, in one week into the lockdown. And uh, this is an, uh, a, a pro bono expert team, HR response team, which is available uh, to all the members of the LNOD Roundtable. You can reach out to us to be able to um, register your query. We'll have, uh, in a very short while, have a senior expert uh, reach out to you so that you can get that person's input, perspective, uh, and support to be able to solve your query or your dilemma or your challenge within your organization um, for absolutely no cost. And these are people you would reg regularly never be, never be available Pro bono, a lot of them run their own consulting services, are veteran professionals, um, actually consult, um, you know, as part of their uh, business, um, who have very kindly and generously offered these services free for members of the LNOD roundtable through the lockdown. So contact the HR response uh, team, should you have a query, should you have a challenge, do you have a pain point where you want an expert point of view, you want an expert input. Uh, at absolutely no cost to you or your organization. So these are pro bono expert services. Please reach out to us. It's called the HR response team. Um, with that, we, uh, we come to uh, why we're here today, which is the, um, the learning webinar. And this time the topic that we're looking at is beyond resilience, exploring the anti-fragile mindset. And I know resilience has become a big word, um, especially through these very unprecedented times that we're all experiencing. Um, this has clearly never ever happened even during the duration of the careers of people uh, who, who are currently part of the corporate world or even consulting the corporate world. This is so unprecedented and so incredible. The entire world in a lockdown um, situation, uh, this is a pandemic that has impacted and infected people across the world, disrupted the lives of millions of people, uh, cost many people their lives um, a lot of people, anxiety and fear associated with their, with their jobs, with their livelihoods, uh, with the future. I mean, if there's one compelling uh, attribute that we're looking at for people across levels within organizations, why just in the business world, but everywhere is resilience. And to be able to take you through um, essentially the anatomy of resilience and what constitutes the anti-fragile mindset, I'm really delighted to be able to welcome um, Preeti DeMello, uh, who currently uh, handles leadership development and diversity at um, the very uh, respected Tata Consulting Services. Um, Preeti is the global head of diversity and the lead academy at TCS, and she's also an expert in positive organizational development and change. Um, she has a master's in positive OD from Case Western Reserve University. Um, and um, she uh, has also, um, also been through positive um, coaching psychology uh, programs at the Harvard University and um, through leadership maturity coaching. Um, she holds an advanced practitioner certification in polarity approach for continuity and transformation and appreciative inquiry has done extensive process work in, and emotional intelligence work amongst others. At TCS BPS, uh, Preeti's uh, mandate is to create a sustainable culture of leadership and diversity. She previously launched a, a global initiative of coaching and mentor, mentorship via leadership development intervention at TCS. And this initiative has been lauded uh, by um, Institute of Coaching, Harvard, and also won the gold from Brandon. So she has huge amount of accolades and awards to her credit for her very outstanding choreography. Um, she has over 30 years of experience in various industries and sectors, having worked in education and training international business, publishing, social infrastructure, lifestyle, and retail, 
this is a very very well rounded um, kind of exposure across industries she also works with integral yoga and buddhism bringing together a toolkit of polarity thinking and zen coaching um positive and constructive development psychology this should be very very interesting and given her body of work and also her leaning towards positive psychology i think this is going to be a treat to listen to uh, we're delighted to have you on board uh, preeti uh, i think with that over to you uh, sunit if you can help switch the um uh, if you can help us switch the uh, the decks uh, you know over to preeti's deck are you going to share the screen with her all right everyone use the e chat box on your right to be able to post your comments your questions and uh, you can use the q and a you can see a q and a box at the bottom use that to post questions for the speaker and i'll try and moderate some of that at the end of this we have a running time of about 40 minutes uh, for this uh, conversation today and then we'll take some questions so over to you preeti thank you sujaya thank you so very much wonderful to be here with all of you um let's jump into it straight away it's a it's a good time good time in our the history of humanity we are undergoing something that we will live to tell stories about uh i i believe that this is typically a black swan event <clears throat> it is unprecedented as sujaya said uh, it has come with already come with great impact severe consequences shutdowns on business on mental health uh incredibly positive consequences on nature and our environment the upheaval is immense internal upheaval within the lives of people within their beings as well as in the external world and a good sign to be able to read this is to see how many myth makers have emerged how many storytellers have emerged how many knowledge makers have risen uh if you look at what's going around on say a linkedin or a facebook or a twitter everybody's commenting because human beings are essentially meaning making beings we need to make sense of a situation to be able to work with it without that we would potentially be rudderless so this is a time where we actually and genuinely can find a way to tap into our life expertise and interpret the experience on hand and which is exactly what i'm going to do uh, from my lens and uh, let's explore this for a while and then like so just said we'll take questions in the end so this is the idea of the 13th fairy and i i want to read some of this out to you so the 13th fairy comes from uh, grim brothers sleeping beauty and the story is that the the king wanted to um, host a feast to celebrate the birth of his little baby girl and there were 13 fairies in his kingdom now one of them was um, a tad crooked she was not the kindest and she was difficult uh to add to the challenge they also had only 12 gold plates so they invited everybody but the the snarly fairy the one who wasn't very pleasant now when the 12 fairies arrived uh they were not perturbed because like i said the 13th fairy was known to be troublesome and she was known to be cruel as well they all blessed but for one they all blessed the baby girl and blessed her with riches and abundance and a good health and so on and so forth now just at that time in arrives the 13th fairy and the 13th fairy felt rejected and was upset at being left out and she cursed the baby girl with death at the age of 16 uh fortunately for the for the family there was um uh, one fairy to go who softened the blow by saying well she she'll sleep for 100 years but she will wake up and she will be rescued now why do i bring this idea in i bring this idea in to ask you that as we make and uh, as we construct the myth and as we unravel the myth the question to each one of you is what do you believe is the 13th fairy in your life and when i ask the question about in your life it's not about just you as an individual it's about you and your entire set of stakeholders we all have stakeholders we all have stakeholders in the uh in our uh, personal space as well as the, fam the familial as well as the professional so in your family uh, at your workplace in your community and finally not to forget the largest system of all is the system which is the planet 
So who is the 13th fairy who, great, who has gate crashed your party or our party as COVID-19? What does this signify? What is it that we have ignored and has now shown up quite uninvited? Who is this? So, which brings me to the, to the, to the point that every organization is a wholly owned subsidiary of the environment. And if anybody has a doubt around this, it won't take us longer than a minute to reflect into what is really happening right now and be able to analyze and see that actually it is the environment that has shut us down. We've forgotten this because we are all racing ahead to be more successful, to make more money, to do all the things that are humanly very necessary to do. However, there is something we marginalized. There is something we ignored. And it's a good time to ask ourselves, why is it that we are wired to ignore what we are not inspired by? Be it uh, sustainable solutions, be it not using plastic, be it um, uh, anything environment related. What is it that we have ignored in this time frame? So the usual response to crisis is either fear or acceptance. The idea of fear is and another expression for that would be fragility. Uh, what does tend to happen as the, men, the, the human mind is so constructed that the amygdala fires up, it clouds our judgment, uh, we start uh, panicking, which basically takes away our ability to take good decisions. And it happens to all of us at some time or the other. What also happens is this idea of acceptance to say, all right, this is what I'm going through. Here's what the reality is. This is what I'm going to do with it. Uh, which another expression for it is resilience. Now, resilience also allows us to integrate new information, make better decisions, and bounce back. Bounce back, leap back, and, and, and persevere. So to understand anti-fragility, it's extremely critical that we get a sense of fragility and honor it. Because the idea is never to, um, to marginalize fragility and let that become our next 13th fairy. Let's address what fragility might be. It is that part of us that might break under pressure. Our inability to sometimes take the stress that surrounds us. It also is that part of us that needs more attention uh, when we have to manage change or we have to be able to absorb a certain pressure around us. In this time of uh, fragility, which is also another version of COVID-19, what is it that is being asked of us? What's the demand? Now, this is fairly commonplace, but I'm going to, just for continuity and understanding, continue to tell you about it. We are being asked to isolate ourselves. We are being asked to take care of those who are in our care, follow protocols, ensure safety for ourselves and others. We are being asked to attend to the sustainability of our family, our teams, and our clients. Now, do recognize this is my myth unfolding. This is my story unfolding because this is how I'm reading it. And you will potentially have either a similar or a slightly differing or a very differing approach, but stay with me and ask yourself, what does your fragility demand vis-a-vis -vis COVID-19? Um, <clears throat> the other ask is calm your mind, center your thoughts, and and move towards our, what we call PEA, positive uh, attractors. What do we, how do we veer towards positivity so that we can actually continue this process of renewal so that we can restore? Rationalize our fears. The more we think about them, actually sometimes draw them out, write them out, they start making sense. We start understanding, all right, that was possibly um, you know, my amygdala firing up, but it really, I can rationalize that fear. That's not really true. And I love to say this because I feel like it's such a great spiritual practice for me is I like to loosen my grip on reality and awaken my imagination at the same time. When I do those two simultaneously, I realize that my fragility in a sense calms down. And I'm being asked to do that because I'm being asked to look into the future and potentially prepare future forward to say, what is it that would be asked of me in the next two years, three years? And can I go there today? I can only go there today if I'm present now. And if I'm present now, how do I go through this? 
which leads us to discovering the idea of resilience. Now, resilience is a human, innate human ability. It's not um, something that is from the um, lens of universal dynamic from either metaphysics or quantum physics seen to be as something that is uh, unusual. It is exceptional, but not unusual. Uh, it's our ability where we can withstand stress with confidence and not feel like it's going to engulf us. It is when we are in the driving seat, when we can manage the situation. It's also a time where we know that we will recover from whatever the situation may be. And yet, resilience also comes with a demand. And what's the demand here? The demand that we've already, like, you know, um, the HR Help Center that Sujaya spoke of, or mental health uh, initiatives that Sujaya is running, launch assist and sustain a crisis command center. We all have done that in some form or the other. We've done that out of our kitchens. We've done that out of our homes. We've done that out of our teams, our organizations. Everybody is, is uh, launching and sustaining a crisis command center. I think we're now at sustained stage. Uh, for us as professionals, to support talent and strategy. Because strategy is altering, which means can we actually look at the present? Can we look at our fragility and build it into our strategy for resilience? Ignoring fragility is never uh, quite the idea. Um, maintain bus business continuity and financing, shore up on supply chain, stay engaged with customers, very, very critical. This reminds me of this big idea of relationality. Without relationality, there really is nothing. There is no, uh, nothing that binds us and builds us together. It's that field of relationality that allows us to move even our businesses forward. So stay engaged. Engage with your business ecosystem. Which says, all right, wonderful. We worked with our fragility. We've integrated it with our resilience. We've understood that. And we have uh, understood resilience. What about tomorrow? What do we do next? And tomorrow couldn't really be about the two of them. There has to be more. What are we up for? What are we being asked to do? How is the myth unfolding, unfurling? What is the demand that's being made on me? Now, we don't have the luxury to respond to the next big crisis with the way we were thinking prior to this crisis. The fact was prior to this crisis, we felt one, it's not gonna to happen to me. Two, it's not gonna to happen to us. And three, it's somewhere far away in the future. However, there were enough signs that something critical is going to happen. And neither businesses nor individuals, um, but for a handful of mystics and, um, and uh, influencers in business did speak about it but they were heard as like, all right, this is a great philosophy and a great thought. Let's see where it goes. We didn't think that we would be wrapped up in this, in this challenge. And the reason we didn't think is because we are, are no longer living in complexity. We are living in hyper complexity. And this idea of hyper complexity, if you look at the, look at the lines um, at the point 2000, you'll see that the, the mess of hypercomplexity is huge. And while it's a mess, it's also an opportunity. And what that opportunity might present is uh, for us to see, for us to unravel. But there is something that's presenting itself right now. For those of us who live in Bombay, I've heard about stories, haven't seen it myself, that the water is blue. Uh, I know that I can sit out in the evenings and see stars. Uh, and I hear that the dolphin's out. Uh, which is um, really quite incredible. And that is uh, hypercomplexity presenting its advantage. Now, we also do know that this birthing of the new that is emerging along with the old is a sign of what we might need to do. So the human uh, state in itself is complex and our intelligence in the current form is not serving it. What we really need to do is be able to understand the intricacies of the system. Can we, in this hyper-complex hyper -complex ecosystem, 
see the overlapping um, of uh, interdependencies. It's no longer um, something we can ignore. And this study from Stanford University in April of 2020, which is rather late apparently for us to do anything about it, was really interesting, which said the destruction of forests into fragmented patches is, is increasing the likelihood that viruses and other pathogens will jump from wild animals to humans. Right? Now enter coronavirus and its unpredicted impact unpredicted, unprecedented, capricious impact on the global economy, healthcare, gun sales in the US, all the political upheaval, our education, travel, our children sitting in different countries, our lack of cooperation, etc. So look at what a mess it is. And in this mess, is there something for us to do and read? Is there a message for us that the myth is bringing and how do we make meaning out of it? Now, anti-fragility is the idea of this man called Nicholas, Nassim Nicholas Taleb, who basically says that uh, it's the same wind that will blow off a candle, but it'll energize a fire. Now, you certainly want to be the fire, and you certainly want to wish for the wind. And he talks about anti-fragility as that idea, which is beyond resilience, that idea where resilience appreciated, honored, and acknowledged, resists shocks, learns how to bounce back, and found, finds a way to stay the same. It's about sustainability. But the anti-fragile gets better. So the invitation today is to look at what that might be for us as individuals. It is the opposite of fragile, but there's a little bit of a difference. It is that ability which actually gains from chaos which actually flourishes in chaos. In fact, it needs the chaos or the tension to survive and thrive. How do we, how do we define something like this? This is something, it's in, a, in fact, when I wrote a LinkedIn post on this, somebody wrote back and I'm yet to reply to it to say, are we saying then that we need to always find a way to create chaos around us to be able to thrive? No, and we'll keep that for questions later. But the big idea is that it's beyond resilience. It's the next stage of your, your internal muscle, your internal strength. And it looks somewhat like this. So, fragility and anti-fragility. Let's recognize that anti-fragility, it helps us in understanding fragility and take care of it. Because we don't want to ignore and, uh, fragility and say, you know what, I don't believe in it and I'm anti-fragile and I'm going to move forward. We are fragile. The human being, the human body is fragile. This morning, there was a conversation I was having with a, with a coach of mine who's a nurse in Paris. And she wrote, she says, I am um, also an introvert in her own words. And she says, I am seeing something that I could have never imagined. When I see people walking on the road, I want to tell them, don't be silly, go home. When I see 25 year olds come in with no previous history of illness and not surviving it, I know that somebody took a chance to recognize that we are fragile and to work with it to understand our anti-fragility as somewhat as polarities, somewhat as polarities. It's an intelligent thing to do. So once we get fragility out of the way, it's possible for us to move on and focus on anti-fragility. It's that ability, that multi-hydro snake ability, where we can recover and become a new version of ourselves um, beyond the status quo. We can, we can acknowledge fragility, we can acknowledge our resilience, and yet we can remake ourselves as we go on. So in today's world, the choice is ours to make. We know that you know, if you study neuroscience, you'll see that it's entirely your decision on how you see the world. This pandemic has opened up um, our wisdom uh, to be able to see and perceive things differently. And what is the message that it might hold for us? So what we're gonna do now is I'm gonna take you through a very interesting model. It's a model that we use at TCS and uh, come to a place where we can understand anti-fragility through the lens of what I call the spark. 
uh, and um, it, the model basically rests on the idea that anti-fragility is potentially the only answer to the black swan. So how do we as professionals, individuals, family people, businesses, find a way to inspire ourselves to move beyond resilience, to cultivate the anti-fragile muscle, support all our stakeholders. And here is the spark. Uh, it essentially is stories, paradox, aspiration, resonance, and consciousness. It's a short call, so I can't take you through the, uh, the process of going into little groups and, uh, and uh, discussing this, but these questions will be up on my uh, LinkedIn if you ever need to reflect on them further. So the idea of stories, the stories we tell literally and absolutely make the world we live in. If you want to change the world, you need to change the story. And that's your inner story, your inner rhetoric and your outer dialogue. This is equally uh, applicable for individuals and institutions and uh, very beautifully uh, uh, stated by Michael, who is the CEO of Story Strategic Messaging. Stories support our inner dialogue. Stories allow us to see our reality, work through our biases, negative or positive, and lead within the boundaries of our safety because we all essentially want to be safe. It's also our ability to sift through what is real and what we believe in and to see is it true. It's a time where we connect with our strengths. All stories are heroic. All stories are how we succeeded and how we did well, even after we failed and after we fell. We come out to say, you know what, I made it. It's the first step to discovering our anti-fragility. The very, very first step. And here is how we see it. Because stories are um, the bed of a growth mindset, at this point of time, we'll potentially be saying I'm safe. I'm spending more time with my family. I'm building my relationships. I'm getting to know my family differently. Uh, rather than uh, hoarding, we are talking about having enough, utilizing wisely, uh, reducing, uh, recycling, and repurposing things. Uh, we are recognizing that while this lockdown is what it is, but we're still open and that we are still in control. We are still in control of our health. We are still in control of our immediate ecosystem. We are still in control of our minds. And that's a very big one. So here's the question I'd like you to reflect on. And I'll, I'll pause for a minute after this. Is what is the message COVID-19 has for us? And what is the realization it brings? What is the message or the story COVID-19 has for us? And what is the realization it brings? And what strengths can we build and bring forth to create the next version of ourselves? Take a minute. All right. And once you have that, to recognize that you're so well resourced internally and externally that you potentially have the ability to expand beyond your constraints. Which brings us to saying if that's who I am and that's what my story is, what's the paradox? essentially defined beautifully by Paul Pullman of uh, the ex-CEO of Unilever, where he says, the difference between average and outstanding is the and mentality. We must find and create tensions. I, I wouldn't agree with create tensions, but we must find them for sure because they exist. And insist that people step into them as a space for thinking. This is not a performance issue, but a survival issue. Because managing the paradox 
helps foster creativity and high performance. Creativity, of course, being entirely the funnel for high performance. Now, paradox, to explain this a little further, is those dilemmas that seem contradictory, but are not only true, but are interdependent. Uh, it rests greatly on the fact that only what you can see, you can leverage. If we can't see it, there's nothing we can do with it. It's our ability to see the paradox or the dilemma or the cure sometimes, the tension that exists around us that we can work with the tension and find solutions to move past. Paradox inspires anti-fragility by presenting outcomes that need the crisis to present themselves. This is really key that it says, while it inspires our anti-fragility muscle, we need the crisis to present itself for those paradoxes to emerge because paradoxes are, are best, best uh, visible in resistance, in tensions. There are many going around. I won't read out all of them, but the power of the and uh, is where we are currently are. We are no, no longer making choices and saying, you know what, is it care for me as an individual or is it care for my organization? We are learning very, very swiftly that it's both. We are learning that we have to sustain as much revenue as we can for organization and act with purpose. We are learning to value differences and diversity now, and we are focusing on inclusion and unit, unity. So the, the power of the end is at play greatly at this point. We are being able to work with the paradox. We are being able to, uh, to facilitate and navigate the paradox and able to, in most cases also, leverage the paradox. The, the pandemic throws up unique dilemmas, unique paradoxes. One is, like I said, taking care of self while attending to others, or caring for people's needs while recognizing the needs of the business. Holding people accountable while providing empathy. Maintaining social distance while ensuring emotional connection. Fighting our battles today while reinventing for the future, holding the future forward mindset. The questions that emerge from this are these. What is the resistance we feel working in isolation or working from home? What's the paradox there? How are we thinking about these dilemmas in the new scenario? What is it that we are converting from the or to the and? What are we learning about ourselves? And what in the future will change and what will remain the same? Which essentially is the solution to our paradox. Take a minute and we'll continue. Right, so moving forward, we come to the A of the spark, which is aspiration, which so beautifully expressed by Robert Browning, the poet, our aspirations are our possibilities. It couldn't be better said. Aspirations, to delve a little deeper into the idea of our possibilities, is that ability that moves us beyond where we are currently into a place of anti-fragility and defining what we wish to create. It's a place of innovation and change. This step calls out to say no to what doesn't work and what we don't want. It's as much as saying no as it is aspiring and saying yes to what we want. Now, the current crisis has created a collective, a planetary trauma, sense of trauma and, and discomfort. Uh, there's going to be a collective memory. We will define as a human race who we truly are and where are we going. There might be resistances, but we will certainly, this conversation is going to go on for a while. 
the need right now is for us to transform how we perceive the world as individuals as well as organizations and see this interdependency and the interweaving of the interdependencies. There is so much that is resting on the other that without seeing the whole system, it's hard to say who I am. I need to be able to state my aspiration in conjunction with in alignment with the larger whole. And there is, as aspiration, another expression is its positive vision. It's a, it's a time of possibilities. It's a statement of possibilities. It propels us to actually start talking about what we wish to do. I was talking to a friend the other day who said, so what next for you? Because somewhere, everybody is finding a way to rediscover that part of themselves that needs attention, that they might have marginalized. And marginalizing is not just an idea of, of saying, I don't want to deal with it. Sometimes it's situational. Sometimes it's our inability to work with it because we have other compelling priorities on hand. So if you look at the outermost circle of this uh, circular drawing, it basically says, live now with a clear picture of what's next. And I can't say enough about the future forward idea because it basically is to say, what is it that I can do today in relationship with COVID-19 that I can create, which will serve me and us in the future? It's not about just me in the midst of COVID-19. We are in relationship with COVID-19. How can I turn COVID-19 into an ally so that I can propel my anti-fragile muscle and move forward into the future? The questions to reflect. How have your aspirations altered? What possibilities have emerged individually for us as well as for the system we live and function in? And how will they inform your future state? Again, my expression would be future forward state because what is coming our way is not where we've been. So what is our, what's our definition? Uh, given that we are running out of time, we'll take half a minute on this one and I'll move forward. All right, let's continue. So with having taken our intention and our attention to stories, to paradoxes and dilemmas that exist in our life, uh, to what we aspire for, defining the possibilities that uh, frame our current state of being, we come to this grand and beautiful idea of connection and resonance. So the R of spark basically is to say connection is that energy that exists between, I wouldn't say just two people, it just exists between any two or more, where they feel seen, heard, and valued, where they derive their sustenance and strength from the relationship. Which brings me to this idea that there is a third that emerges when two people are in a relationship. When uh, two people engage in a conversation, the relational field in itself is an entity by itself. And it is, it is that relational field that allows for that connection between those two people or more. And it is that relational field that is rich in its wisdom and its ability to sustain, it's strong and it sustains both relationships. So what is the relational field that we are creating as we live our lives? right now. It also speaks to the idea of um, collaboration or what we are currently calling cooperation. It is the ability to rather than uh, compete can be co-opt, which speaks to the greater and the bigger and the most beautiful aspect of, uh, of this work, which is psychological safety and overall well-being. See the multilarities and how they're coming together. Because all, all what you do in resonance is through a process of connection, dialogue, communication, you are inviting multiple perspectives in and honoring them all with unconditional positive regard. You're not speaking to one of them, you're speaking to all of them. I love this expression. It's, I first heard it from, um, uh, I'm forgetting the name. Uh, 
and I'll come back to the name, I'm sorry, uh, is this big idea that we, the EQ and IQ are, uh, are, no longer, uh, are no longer valid. Because what is really valid is our ability to connect with the other. So it is that VQ that we live in and can we honor that? And if not, what are we really, uh, what are we really talking about? And if we don't honor it, what is it that we are putting at risk? Peter Hawkins is who I heard this from. And uh, the idea of VQ is basically saying, rather than be ecocentric, can I be ecocentric? And ecocentric is not only about ecology, but it's the whole, it's a systems approach, system thinking, which is to say, of course, there must be leadership but within multi-person relationships. There must be many who come together. It really is a quantum leap in how human beings have evolved and seen their own capacity. Because it's, it's being able to see those synergies that define us. Our questions for this, this R are, what is, the different, what is different about our relationships, our personal and professional relationships, and what are we doing to support ourselves and others through this time of change? What are we learning? How can we experiment with the various avenues that are emerging? As you think about it, I'm keeping my eye on the clock, very little time to go, I'm gonna continue, and come to the final lap of the spark, which is consciousness where Dr. Wayne Dyer beautifully says, change the way you look at things and the things you look at change. Consciousness is really that part of our, our internal and external dynamic, which allows us to take meaning, purpose into action. It's what I also like to call karma with the C. And in this new consciousness, we have to start thinking about how we are going to change how are we going to treat people? How are we going to engage in our own small microcosm, microcosm? It starts with our personal lives always. It starts with the self and it starts with the personal life and it goes into professional and community. I'm going to skip this just so that I stay with you on time. <clears throat> Questions to reflect. What is anti-fragile about you right now? How are you taking all your learning, your thinking, the wisdom of your life into an anti-fragile state? How are you reorganizing and re-emerging through this time? And what is that part of you that is actually feeling prosperous? It could be your heart, it could be your work, it could be all of you, but what is that part? Can you articulate it, put it on the table, acknowledge it and recognize it? So to wrap up some really quick guiding principles, the first, learning the biggest competitive advantage, which nobody better than Surjaya, who's providing you this uh, great uh, opportunity to learn from various people, uh, this session beyond. Uh, how do you learn faster than your changing environment? And how do you get better at the game that you're playing uh, so that yesterday's game doesn't define future's game? Recognizing that your language, your words have a very strong impact on everybody, that your words do become worlds for people. And understanding that this is a time, there's a beautiful thought the other day to say, radical time or radical love, really showing up with your words along with everything else. Recognizing that negativity bias is something that we need to work with. I'm not suggesting ignore it, but you need to take, take into account that it's not all there is. So. Um, Jim Hickman, who is a neurologist, says this beautifully. He says, if you take care of the minutes, the years will take care of themselves. Define right now, establish those new neural pathways and say, what is that I want to be? What am I grateful for? Um, how do I engage my brain to create what I want to be in the future and the future being now? Listen to that 13th fairy. Ask yourself, who is not in your stakeholder picture? Take a piece of paper, Make a little circle for yourself in the center and put down your stakeholders. Who have you forgotten? Everything around you is your stakeholder. Your ecosystem, your environment, the people in your life, the animals in your life, the trees around you. Who have you forgotten? 
And how are they connected to the others in the picture? What's the interdependence? What might be the message they're bringing? What are the other options that you have? How are you going to bring in what you might have subconsciously or consciously marginalized? And to finally wrap up, how do you reframe COVID-19 through this anti-fragility lens? How do you gain opportunity to get a control over your work life, learn differently? How do you reconstruct? Uh, and how do you create a positive change? I'm gonna pause here really quickly because I, we have just about eight minutes to go and I'd like to hand it over to Sujia. Happy to take questions and continue talking. Thank you, Preeti. I think we already have very uh, effusive um, sort of reactions and comments to this very meaningful and I must say very touching, uh, very um, opportune, very timely conversation that you've had. And I think that, um, you know, there's, it's kind of obviously uh, moved a lot of people and I would want to take a question here that I have from, I think there's no name here of the participant, but the question is, uh, do you believe that humans by nature are fragile? Um, and if yes, then what can they do to become anti-fragile and move one step further on how they can inspire others to become anti-fragile as well? Well, I do believe that we are both or all three. I think there's a multilarity there. We are fragile, we are anti-fragile, but we are also resilient. Mm -hmm. And I think the best way to go forward is to be able to honor that struggle. Give yourself permission to be uncomfortable. Uh, look for the you stress, the positive stress, the beneficial stress, so that it pushes you out of your comfort zone. It expands you beyond your constraints. Um, look uh, in the direction of positivity. Focus on the well-being of others. Bring in altruism. Learn to take care of yourself. Fail and you know get back on horseback and say, all right, what do I do next? This is also time to inspire autonomy. Get everybody to to hold accountability along with their power. Uh, let's say it's a practice. Allow for mistakes in this practice while you appreciate, acknowledge, and appreciate uh, and, and celebrate uh, what's, what's coming our way. Great, I think there's some more questions coming up and I'm going to try and ask them on behalf of the participants. There's Primrose Jasmine asking, can you share a link where we can refer to the points you have shared uh, this content was very rich and they want to know, is there any place uh, that they can go to where they can read more? Is there any recommended readings? A lot of our speakers end up, um, you know, sending us a, 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 you know, kind of a handout or an article to read. So maybe you can do the same so we can send it to the participants. Lots of them saying that the content was very rich. It would be great to have access to some more reading around this. Sure. So there's an article that I've put up on LinkedIn just to, couple of weeks back on this idea of anti-fragility and the spark. Mm -hmm. uh, you're very welcome to look at it. I will also send it to Sujaya for circulation. Yes. Um, uh, but, if, you know, just find me as Preeti DeMello on LinkedIn and you should be able to see it there. Right. I'd be happy to be able to have uh, Prudel and the team uh, get hold of it from LinkedIn and, pa and pass it on to everyone. So uh, Primrose, we'll try and make sure it comes to you. Um, it, so this is Vikas Shirodkar and I think he has... Um, no question. He's just making a comment, which is that uh, he's saying Sujaya and LNOD team, this is arguably the best session I have attended in quite a while. Very different thinking, very creative and still highly applicable, very beautifully expressed. And kudos to Preeti for such an amazing session. So oh. thank you one more time. So some very effusive comments, like I said. Um, does compartmentalization help in switching between fragility resilience and anti-fragility. This is Rachel White asking you this question. Does compartmentalization help in switching between fragility, resilience and anti-fragility? Well, the very fact that the question comes up is because it doesn't. Hmm. Because we really can't, we are, we are fungible beings. We are, we are made of, um, you know, love and starlight. We, yeah. we can't be put in compartments. Even our, you know, for those who think that the head and the heart are not in communication, really need to look up the idea of the heart brain. We are, it, there is a great interdependency in us, within us, on this group, we have about, about 100 people, uh, within our ecosystem, outside our doors, in the greater world. So no, it doesn't. But what does help? And what, what inspires me about your question is, can we possibly 
explore one idea at a time and then see the relevance of that idea and the interdependency with the next. I personally like to start with fragility because I know I'm fragile. I know that my ecosystem is fragile and I want to put in order what I can and then move into being braver than I was. Right. Okay, we've got Anand Bhatnagar um, from the Reliance Group and he's asking, first of all, he thanks you for your words of wisdom. This was a very meaningful session. May I request you to share some more thoughts on VQ? So can you tell us a bit more about VQ? Well, the idea of VQ as expression itself says is the idea of you and me as we and how, what's our quotient and how many people can you bring into the VQ? You know, the idea of empathy is um, we, are, uh, we are empathetic beings or we need to, uh, need to build our empathy or learn to be empathetic. And it's very, very learnable. Emotional intelligence is very, very learnable. It's a matter of, of experience and expression. VQ is a matter of practice. Hmm. It's about saying, can I engage with those I don't want to engage with? Can I engage with those who trigger me? Can I engage with those uh, who make me feel uncomfortable or those I'm in con conflict with? And can those engagements be really meaningful? Mm -hmm. My best expression of VQ is getting out of my own way. Mm -hmm. Is to say, can I stop sabotaging my own development, get out of my way so that I can look at, hmm. uh, look at what's really presenting itself. Because interestingly, the gold is between you and me. Hmm. And when I know you, I've let go of the gold. So I don't want to lose that opportunity. I want to engage with everybody uh, who I resist in some form or the other. Right. You know, at this stage, I'm going to bring in Vinti Mehrotra. Uh, Sunit, can you help us bring in uh, Vinti into the conversation? Uh, Vinti is from Fiki and she wants to ask you a question directly. So we're going to try and uh, bring Vinti into the webinar. Hi, uh, I think, uh, thank you for a wonderful session. Thank you, Preeti. Thank you, Sujaya. Uh, although I've posted the question uh, in the chat box, which says that in the era of, uh, so, you know, there's so much of uncertainty, which is looming large. How do you see such triggers um, of, um, uh, which will, which, and how can we preempt those triggers for fragility in advance and how do we address them? Well, the only way to preempt fragility is to understand, uh, uh, to understand fragility. Uh, to, the only way to deal with ambiguity is to observe ambiguity. Uh, mm -hmm. there's, there's no way that we will be able to tell what's going to happen tomorrow. But in the pursuit of tomorrow, we've lost our presence today and thus we are not able to define what might be coming our way. So it sounds a little contradictory or it sounds counterintuitive, but really the ask is to prepare for the ambiguity of tomorrow. Can mm -hmm. I actually engage with the chaos of today. Mm -hmm. And it's that dichotomy that allows the new to emerge. See, eventually we're not going to have, um, we're not going to have a cheat sheet. What we're really going to have is an ability. Mm -hmm. And that ability is, uh, is how organizations will transform, how we support our people, how we individually transform. Because you know, I, I personally believe as I'm as much my organization as everybody else is. So when I transform and change, I impact and influence those around me. How do I make that alteration? So it's the process of change entirely dependent on my engagement with the present. I hope that answers. There's a, there's a question here I have. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Vinti. Thank you. Uh, Priti, I have a question here from Umesh uh, Girnarkar and he's asking, is there any assessment test to measure the anti-fragility? Uh, anti no. Um, well, I, for one, I have to admit that I'm not a, I'm not the, uh, I'm standing on the, on the shoulders of giants when I present anti-fragility. It's not my yeah. original idea. I built it into the spark, which is mine. However, uh, no, there is no assessment, but you can assess yourself. Yeah. You can assess your, you know, put it down in three columns, put down. In fact, if you follow the spark through the questions that are available on LinkedIn, you'll be able to see where you are on the anti-fragility map. Because here's the interesting thing. We are all fragile, we are all resilient, and we all have an anti-fragile muscle in some way or the other. Now, the point is, can we expand that? Can we make that so strong and so uh, robust that 
you can actually rely on it and call upon it whenever you need. So true. Uh, I'm going to take this as the last question, Preeti, because we're already past five. Um, you know, there's Ram Iyer asking, in resilience, we learn about bounce forward. Is that part of anti-fragility? Well, in resilience, we learn to bounce back. Hmm. Because resilience is about status quo. But I love the idea of bounce forward or future forward um, is uh, the idea of anti-fragility. When creatively... Uh, inspired by fragility. Hmm. You know, the, one, of the, one of my big lessons um, as I'm growing older is recognizing that my, my personal strength was I am so strong. I can, I can get past anything. Recognizing to be vulnerable is my anti-fragility. Right. So there are, there are there's a lot of counterintuitive messaging, but Really, I, my, my senses open up your hearts to this and you'll find something interesting for yourself. Yes, yes, absolutely. So I think this has been absolutely fabulous. It's been very different from what it is that we've done through our various learning sessions. So thanks for bringing that in. Uh, thanks for sharing the Spark model and uh, all your generosity in being able to come forth uh, with your own insights and you know, inspiring so many people here. They're very effusive comments. We're happy to be able to send you some of these uh, comments that we've got in the chat box. Um, many of them thanking you, saying this was awesome. I want to be able to thank you, Preeti, and uh, I'm hoping that we'll be able to send them the article which uh, we promised to be able to send. I don't want to take more time. Just very quickly, some final announcements for everyone, um, which is um, we have the diversity and inclusion study, which is ongoing. We accepted the last date of that. We're inviting entries in 13 categories, request all of you from your organizations to participate. This is the best diversity and inclusion practices of Asia study. Uh, I also want to call out the panel discussion which we have on COVID-19, the HR recovery plan, which is slated for four o'clock on Friday. So don't forget that. Uh, Sunit, you've not switched over to my deck yet. So I'm not unable to show them some of these screens. Um, but for all of you, here's our COVID-19, the HR recovery plan. Uh, you have a very robust um, panel here. We've got Gautam Chenani of JSW, Chandrasekhar Sripara of ISB. You've got Preeta Santanam of McKenzie. You've got Sanjay Muttal of Contempor and Jay Kumar of LNT uh, in conversation with me on COVID-19, the HR recovery plan. This is part three on our three-part series on the HR response to COVID-19. I recommend strongly you join this important conversation on, the, on, the, uh, on Friday which is the 24th of, uh, uh, you know, of April and uh, come in on board and uh, join this important discussion uh, four to five. So see you on Friday. We've also got, uh, not to forget, Diarise the 30th. We have an international speaker on EQ in VUCA times. We have Huilo Tuscani joining us uh, from Spain to be able to deliver this, how EQ can help you drive change in VUCA times. So you still have more interesting learning events coming up uh, through the Learning and OD Roundtable. Don't forget the HR Response Center, uh, which is our pro bono expert team, expert response team that is available in case you, your organization, need any of this. Happy to be able to support you. Otherwise, reach out to Prudel and to uh, Tessin, uh, should you need any help with uh, both the HR Response Team or, rec or re registering your seat on the forthcoming webinars. So thank you everyone for being here today, for your patience of staying on and all the very best. Look forward to uh, seeing you on Friday. Join us on Friday at 4 p.m. One more time, thank you Preeti for a wonderful session. This has really been a treat, um, you know, thought provoking and uh, very from the heart. So thank you so much for doing this for us.